It's always a privilege to speak at this meeting, and over the years, I look back and I've learned so much about prostate cancer, and I've learned so much about how, what you guys have to do each day that it's really helped me become a, a better radiologist. So thank you very much. So we're in the localized disease uh, part of the session of, of the meeting, and I was charged with talking about accurate staging uh, with radiology. So I'm going to focus more on the imaging of metastatic disease. So we do it correctly so that when we treat localized disease, we're sure it's really just localized disease. So I think there are a couple questions that are important to this. All right. So the questions become what imaging tools are available? And I think this is really confusing because there's been a lot of developments uh, in radiology and nuclear medicine with regards to the imaging tools currently available. And the other question is when do I use them? This is a, uh, just a table from the radar article in 2015 that just goes over the different recommendations from all the various uh, groups, AUA, ACR, uh, Prostate Cancer Working Group 2. Uh, and there's a lot of sort of differences between the different recommendations among all these different societies. And I think that creates a lot of confusion. So for today's talk, I'm really going to talk about the past, the present, and the future. And another goal of mine is to sort of filter the signal from the noise. And I think one of the frustrating parts of prostate cancer imaging is everyone reads the journals and you see all these different letters attached to either F18, C11, uh, or O18. And I think that creates a lot of confusion. So today I'm just going to filter it down to the ones that I think are important and I think that are going to change the way we practice in the near future. So first, we're going to talk about the first generation uh, imaging modalities. And, you know, yesterday Dr. Crawford had shared a slide about the first... Uh, article talking about bone scintigraphy, and that was from 1972. Uh, so fast forward to 2016, and we're still using this as sort of our standard of care imaging when it comes to bones. Um, you see the images here, just typical planar images. We acquire them anterior, posterior views. We could acquire lateral views and do spec and other things as needed. Uh, it's, it served us really well, but I would argue there are better things out there, and I think we need to explore those different areas. Prostacin something that's really fallen out of favor in the past few years. Um, one of the big problems with prostacin is it binds to an internal epitope, a PSMA, which often detects necrotic disease and, and has sort of decreased sensitivity. The performance of the exam is a little more difficult. It occurs over multiple days. That being said, there are still some groups out there that are having some success with this. And I know Dr. Keene at MUSC is uh, using this and, and is happy with the performance of this. But I think overall, I think the NCCN guidelines also dropped this from the recommendations as well. So sodium fluoride, we think of this in, in a lot of ways as a novel imaging tool, but it's really not novel. It's actually been around uh, longer than TEC-99 uh, di diphosphonates. Uh, but there's been this resurgence because PET-CT technologies are much more available. I think it's a powerful tool, and we first talked about sodium fluoride PET-CT five years ago at this meeting, and uh, I think it's really helped a lot of practices. And if you haven't started doing this, I encourage you to look into this. So just to show the power of sodium fluoride, uh, we had this recent case. So this was May 18th uh, this year, Gleason 4 plus 5, PSA was 28.73, 28.7. So the, on this typical just standard bone scan, uh, we didn't see any bone mets. We just called it negative. No syntographic evidence of metastatic disease. Next case. All right, so then fast forward to July 19th, a couple months later, they obtained a CT to look for soft tissue disease. They saw this subtle lucency here, which it's pretty nonspecific. We see these lucencies often. If we started calling these METs, you know, I think we would overcall a lot of disease. Um, and since it's prostate cancer, yes, it could be lytic, but we typically sort of prefer to see sclerotic disease because that's as it's more common. So then a couple weeks later, the PSA shot up to 118.4. Dr. Crawford saw the patient, knew something was really wrong. And despite a negative bone scan from a couple months prior, he went ahead and ordered a sodium fluoride PET-CT. And if you look at this MIP image here, you see this marked burden of osseous metastatic disease throughout predominantly the axial, but also the proximal appendicular skeleton. And this was probably one of the most dramatic cases I've ever seen in that short of interval between a, a planar bone scan and sodium fluoride PET-CT. And if you look at the cross-sectional images, you see intense uptake in these bones. And on the CT, it actually looks completely normal. Um, you know, there's no sclerotic disease. Uh, but again, yeah, the PSA went up. And I, but I would argue, had we done this sodium fluoride even up front, had it been 
uh, we probably would have detected a disease or, or a lesion or two in those cases. But again, this is important because, you know, clearly this isn't localized disease anymore that we're dealing with. Uh, this was, uh, I forget what therapy they received, but after some therapy, the bone lesions on CT became sclerotic. So this was probably just a case of lytic disease that was missed. And there have been papers talking about how even though sodium fluoride detects bony changes, it still is more sensitive for lytic disease and has actually had success in imaging renal cell cancers too, which often planar bone scans miss. So it's a great tool. So GU ASCO recently had a, uh, this past meeting had a uh, discussion about uh, will sodium fluoride PET CT replace bone scintigraphy? Uh, and that's something we also discussed in the Arizona meeting uh, a couple of years ago. There's a good review on that. I believe it's on eurotoday.com that sort of outlines the discussion at that meeting uh, with regards to sodium fluoride PET CT. This is an update from CMS's decision December 15th, this past, this, just a, a month ago. So CMS determined that they were not going to pay for sodium fluoride PET CT in part because there wasn't enough data. There was data that showed there was change in patient management, but CMS wanted to see more data with regards to outcomes. So they want to see changes that lead to more appropriate palliative care or more appropriate curative care, improved quality of life or improved survival. So this was very disappointing, but that being said, CMS agreed to extend the National Oncologic Pet Registry program for another two years for sodium fluoride PET CT. So if you haven't done it right now, you can go ahead, sign up, and again, uh, CMS will cover this for the next two years at least, and then more data will be collected, and hopefully, you know, in a year or two, we could resubmit for uh, reimbursement or approval. All right, so we're going to move on to the second generation radiopharmaceuticals, and this is when it becomes a little more novel. And I'm sure all of you have heard about C11 choline. We've heard about it for the past couple of years. Uh, but we've been very frustrated with C11 choline because we keep hearing about it, but we can never order it. And even at the University of Colorado, we had looked into starting our own C11 choline program, but the costs were too high. The time was, you know, would take too long to get it uh, available. And in the end, we just decided not to. So I think C11 choline is great. It's, it's, you know, the data there, a lot of it coming out of the Mayo Clinic in Europe has been really promising. But again, the idea of access, the problem with access is really what's killing this, this radiopharmaceutical. Because uh, again, the, the reason is C11, carbon-11, only has a 20-minute half-life and requires a medical cyclotron to be on site if you're going to do these, these exams. And a medical cyclotron is a very expensive and complicated endeavor. Um, so FACBC, amino acid analog, this is why, this is very promising. I think this is why we're no longer going to, going to talk about C11 choline in the near future. The key to FACBC is it's F18. So it's a half-life of two hours as opposed to 20 minutes. This makes commercialization of this radiopharmaceutical much more feasible than C11 choline. But the question is, how does FACBC compare to C11 choline? The beauty of both of these agents, and there are other agents out there like C11 acetate and whatnot that are, that are good as well, but I'm just going to focus on these two. The beauty of these two is it detects disease in bone and soft tissues. So instead of ordering a CT scan and a bone scan separately, you could actually just get this one scan and detect disease in both sites. So this was a recent paper published in uh, Clinical Nuclear Medicine, August 2015, that compared FACBC versus choline. This came out of Italy, prospective study with 50 patients. They received both of these scans within one week. Uh, on a per-patient analysis, the FACBC and the C11 choline were negative on both scans in 33 of the 50 patients. In uh, the FACBC was positive and choline was negative in six of those cases. So FACBC detected six uh, disease in six patients that choline did not. And then uh, they were both positive in 11, and FACBC was neg never negative when choline was positive. So the, the FACBC performed better than the choline in that study. Uh, this is on a per lesion basis, and again, <laughs> FACBC detected more lesions uh, in more patients than C11 choline. This is just some example images from uh, that paper. You see this aortic cable lymph node, it's sub-centimeter. If you were just getting a CT scan with IV contrast, no one would call this metastatic disease. But when you add the radiopharmaceutical to it, there was a little bit of uptake there. They called it metastatic disease. And on choline, there was no activity localizing to that lymph node. 
This was a bone lesion. I don't think this is the greatest example, but this is what they published, showed increased uptake in that right iliac bone compared to C11 choline, which allowed them to call that positive as opposed to negative. Based on PSA levels, FACBC performed better than C11 choline at PSA levels less than one, one to two, two to three, and greater than three. I wouldn't take the you know detection rates at PSA levels to because uh, the sample size was too small, but at all the different levels, FACBC did perform better than uh, the C11 choline. This is the exciting part of FACBC, which is relatively new. So it's being commercialized by Blue Earth Diagnostics, and they've actually entered into contracts with PetNet, which is, is a subsidiary of Siemens. So they have the infrastructure in place to distribute this radiopharmaceutical across the country and pretty much across the world as well. And it, there's this uh, little blurb from Aunt Minnie that talks about how this was just accepted for priority review at the FDA, and this was dated December 2, 2015. So hopefully, I don't know how long it'll take, but maybe in six to 12 months, we'll actually see the approval of this uh, for use. Third generation. This is when, this is more long-term future. It's the exciting stuff, but you know, I wouldn't hold our breath at the moment. That being said, I, eh, it's not too far away. The PSME agents are the real exciting agents that are, are gonna change the way we image patients as well. Gallium-68 is something that you've all probably heard about. The beauty of Gallium-68 is its sensitivity at low PSA values have been, has been really good. And if you look at PSA values less than 0.5, it showed a 58% detection rate, which is better than all the other prior uh, rate of pharmaceuticals. Then we're gonna move on to FDC, FDC, FBC, which uh, came out of Johns Hopkins. They did a recent study published in the jur uh, Journal of Nuclear Medicine that looked at 13 patients and what they found was it wasn't as sensitive compared to, so this was looking at primary disease, not metastatic disease. Uh, Dr. Keene, this is what we were talking about uh, last month. But what they found was it wasn't as sensitive compared to MRI, but the radiopharmaceutical had higher specificity for high grade and larger tumors compared to MRI. So I think that's really exciting because it brings up the idea of PET MRI. And I think Dr. Andriol in the discussion earlier had talked about PET MRI and this is, I think, an ideal use of where we could combine MRI with this radiopharmaceutical for primary disease and actually be able to detect those higher-grade tumors that will lead to more morbidity and mortality. So I think this is a game-changer, but it's PET MRI. Four and a half, five million dollars for a machine, and you're not getting reimbursed for it. So I think there's still a lot of questions with regards to what is the exact role of PET MR in the future, but I think it's very exciting and it's an area that's being investigated heavily. Theranostics is another area that's exciting. It's uh, the ability to image and treat disease simultaneously, and that's only possible because these PSA agents are more specific for prostate cancer. This comes from a review article, an image provided by Dr. Peter Choiki uh, that talks, shows DCFBC being investigated now for the detection of metastatic disease as well. So it could be used in the primary setting and hopefully in the metastatic setting as well. So the question becomes, when do you deploy these different radiopharmaceuticals or when do you deploy these different uh, imaging agents? And that's when we sort of go back to the radar guidelines. Uh, Dr. Crawford had uh, organized this with Dr. Petrolak uh, a couple years ago to really look at when we should image. And in 2015, this was actually one of the top 10 viewed or downloaded radiolo or, uh, urology articles uh, uh, for that year. So it sort of puts patients into three different buckets, newly diagnosed patients, biochemical recurrent patients, and M0 CRPC patients. Uh, and it gives recommendations as to when you should image them. And you don't image low uh, risk patients, uh, but PSA levels greater than 10, Gleason scores, it should be greater than equal to seven or palpable disease. Um, and then biochemical recurrent patients. M0 CRPC patients, there's no good data out there, but amongst the the group that was assembled, a multidisciplinary group, we voted and um, as to what would be the best uh, manner in which to image those patients. And the decision was first scan when the PSA level was greater than, equal, greater than or equal to two nanograms per milliliter, and then image uh, the second scan when the PSA equaled five, and every doubling of PSA thereafter based on a check of the PSA every three months. Because we realized that the M0 patients were not being imaged frequently enough and we were missing or we were detecting metastatic disease too late. Uh, we wrote another review article talking about sort of piggybacking on the radar guidelines, incorporating sodium fluoride into col and choline 
uh, into that algorithm. But I would argue we could just sort of put FACBC in that algorithm uh, once it is approved. So I think the two take-home messages are if you haven't or incorporated sodium fluoride PET-CT, it's available, it's being reimbursed by CMS, I think it's worth a shot. Number two, let's get excited about FACBC. I think, you know, we will no longer have reasons to complain about C11 choline because we'll have an equal, if not better, rated pharmaceutical available, hopefully, in the near future. And, you know, let's image, you know, let's image our patients more frequently, but let's image them smarter based on their, uh, how they present.